times in the International Organization in Geneva, when they realized there is no other way but to talk about human rights, the first fear, and it's natural, the first fear is, well, but we don't have human rights people in our secretariat. And that is why you have the HRC. So you can have a fluid dialogue between the Office of the High Commissioner and ILO, WHO, ONU, CEDA, whenever something with a human rights perspective. Labor rights were not, 100 years ago, were not mentioned as human rights. But we all know we are talking about human rights. Decent jobs. What are we talking? We are talking about human rights. And 190 Convention of ILO on, on women and gender, what is? It's human rights. So this dialogue of technical multivitaminic that is able to introduce properly the human rights discussion is the future, definitely. Welcome everyone to this new episode of The Next Page, the podcast of UN Geneva Library and Archives designed to advance the conversation on multilateralism. Today we're going to have an episode on looking at the Human Rights Council from the inside. We have a conversation with Ambassador Federico Villegas, who's been the 16th president of the Human Rights Council last year in 22. Human rights, of course, are a burning issue at the very center of the international arena because they're fundamental to humankind. And this year in 23, we also celebrate 75 years since the adoption of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights back in December 48 here at the UN. The Human Rights Council convenes here in Geneva and Federico Villegas has been elected president of the Council in 21, for the session in 22. He's the permanent representative of Argentina to the UN in Geneva, and in that uh, role has been also a guest of this uh, podcast uh, before. Today we're so happy to welcome him again in our studio to talk about How was it to be the president of the Human Rights Council 22? Very complex here, a very challenging set of issues. And what can we learn from his uh, presidency? Let me just add that um, our guest is not only an ambassador, uh, a career diplomat. He's also been assistant professor in his younger years of international law at the National Universities uh, of uh, Rosario and Buenos Aires in Argentina. And so I'm so glad to have you back here in the studio. And please, if you want to tell our audience a little bit about yourself and a little bit also of how you became the president. How does it work? Who elects the president of the Human Rights Council? Thank you. Good morning and good morning to all the listeners. This is a very important podcast and congratulations for being uh, so active and so engaged um, with this uh, Podcast. Uh, well, definitely the presidency is uh, in a rotation on a regional basis. So uh, at the end of each year, the council elects the bureau, the president and the vice presidents of the next year. And in my case, I had the privilege uh, of being endorsed by my whole region, the Grulak, uh, as to nominate me as uh, the candidate of the region to take over the presidency in 2022. And I say that I, I, it's a privilege because we have to remember that, unfortunately, the year before, 2021, for the first time in history since the council was created, we had to vote to elect the president because the region at that time, Asia and Pacific, did not reach an agreement to have one candidate of the region. They had two, and there was no other way but to literally vote. And in the middle of the pandemic, we had to come to this building, still open, at the General Assembly Hall because of the distance, and we voted and the ambassador, permanent representative of Fiji, uh, became elected as, as chair. So in my case, of course, I, I, I was lucky. I, I, I was. It was by consensus of the of the whole uh, region and of the whole council. So the council is a centerpiece of how states and international community at large deals with human rights. So let's have a little bit of an overview of the Council and why it is important for our listeners that may not be so, you know, um, cognizant of the role of the Council or simply they they see the Council in the press or or in the TV news, but they don't know uh, 
how it, it works. Of course, um, it goes without saying that uh, this is a tough time or even really tough time for international relations, for international organizations. And, um, you know, those global problems that cannot be solved by any country alone are still there. Uh, some of them, like climate, uh, are becoming even bigger. And international organizations like the UN do struggle to work at the same time on making a difference in the lives of citizens and building consensus among governments whose focus is always constantly split between national interest and global challenges. I suspect the Human Rights Council, from that political angle, makes no exception. So you've been the president, you know the, the council. How would you describe the work of the council and why it is it so important to the international community? To say it in, in brief words, the Human Rights Council is the only a body of the UN that touches the life of every single person of the world, first of all. And every one of our listeners today, when they wake up and until they go to bed and until they get old, they are touched by the work of the Human Rights Council. Why? Because we have three main roles. The first one is the hub of the progressive development of new human rights norms and standards. What does it mean? The, 70, the, the Declaration of uh, Human Rights, the Universal Declaration 75 years ago, was just the, the first stone of a new revolutionary idea of international law of human rights. And that first stone became a huge building of international law of human rights with over 10 treaties, 47 international mechanisms of protection, etc., etc. Here, in Geneva, in the Council, is where the discussions of states and NGOs and stakeholders uh, make a reality these new standards. And therefore, just to give one example of last year, we approved cyberbullying resolution. We uh, approved a resolution on the nuclear, uh, the impact on human rights of nuclear legacy on the places where there were nuclear tests and three or four generations have been affected in the right to uh, health. We approve a resolution on the impact on human rights of new military technologies, which is at the same time in Geneva, a discussion that we are having in the Conference on Disarmament on lethal autonomous weapons. So, um, and of course, discussions on the independent expert on uh, sexual orientation and gender identity, which is another huge discussion that in principle what it means is a decision of the international community to address a group of people that have been affected by discrimination and is here where new standards are being applied. And then at the same time the other role why the people are touched by it is that the empathy, the basic notion of human rights was born out of the idea that we can have an empathy for the suffering of people that we don't even know that live on the other side of the world. That is the basic notion of human rights. And in the council, that's exactly what we do. And now with social media, like this podcast or uh, somebody that follows on Twitter, we see that people are touched by the suffering of the women in Afghanistan that cannot go to school, of the pro people that have been having a, a repression for the protest of Magda Amini, or the people, of course, in Ukraine that is suffering. So that in the council we address those human rights situations very difficult ones and last year was very special because we saw the rest of the international system and especially the collective security system that we created in the charter be precisely for an event like the war in ukraine not to happen be prevented or react if it happened paralyzed and only four days only four days after the Security Council was paralyzed, not reacting to that, for the veto, of course, four days after that here in Geneva, before anything else, foreign ministers decided, because we do not have a veto here, decided to have uh, to address the situation uh, of Ukraine first 
and approve a historic commission of inquiry uh, to investigate the violations of human rights. So that's another example how we are able to address uh, issues that, uh, and that's why those important roles we are, represent one of the three pillars uh, along with development and peace and security of the UN. One key feature of the Council is the universal peer review for diplomats is known as UPR. What is it and how it works and does it generate progress for human rights for the people in countries? Yes, definitely. It's, it's the, we would call it the crown jewel of the council because it comes after 50 years of unfairness. What, what does it mean? The predecessor of the council was the Commission of Human Rights. For 50 years, only the human rights situations of a certain few countries were addressed here in Geneva. The ones that got all the tickets, and we have cases like Cuba that got all the tickets every year, for example. But other cases, depending on the geopolitics of the time and the specific power of politics, were put on the spot on their human rights situation. And it was a very un unfair system system because 180 something countries never had to put their human rights situation on the table uh, among others my own country with massive and systematic violations of human rights in Argentina we never had a resolution on the human rights situation in Argentina because the geopolitics of the Cold War protected the dictatorship for being on the spot so that system changed with the UPR we decided to have a system by which every single country of the world without exception has to periodically put their human rights situation on the table. Not only that, receive recommendations and criticisms from any other country of the world, public recommendations, a report from NGOs of the country that is concerned, and international NGOs, and a report of a diagnosis of the human rights situation of the Office of the High Commissioner based on all the information of the treaty bodies, especially independent. So you have a diagnosis that of a human rights situation that is not done only by the state, because unfortunately states tend to talk about the good things and hide the bad things. But this good system, which is marvelous, has made possible for states to be in face of the international community live. You know, the last UPR, it was amazing last year, uh, the, the UPR, uh, thousands of organizations gathered to watch live the UN TV channel where a UPR, for example, in the case of India, was being uh, carried out and was being broadcast. So it's an engagement of, of the people. And this system has worked perfectly. I was in the discussions for the establishment of the UPR when we discussed the establishment of the council. And I have to be honest, uh, I was amazed as president to see a discussion that of something that we didn't know if it would work. When we discussed what can we do? Let's create the UPR. But we had no idea if it would work or not. And now as president, I come to a place where this system not only has worked, for it started successfully its fourth cycle of reviews without exception. 193 countries three times had to put their human rights situation without any exception. Um, that is a very strong... And of course, when you have the recommendations accepted by a state before the international community, that's a roadmap to a development in a country with a human rights perspective. So it's a, it has a huge impact in the people because all the human and financial resources on a country can be put if, uh, to work with a human rights perspective and maximize maximize their impact because those recommendations accepted talk about the right to food, about a healthy environment, about discrimination, which is the social and institutional tissue of each country. So just to be precise for our audience, mm -hmm. all countries, members of the UN, undergo a universal peer review of mm -hmm. the situation of human rights in their nation. Uh, but the Human Rights Council is a much smaller membership. So how many countries are represented? How do they get chosen? No, the, it's, a, it's, a, it's like this. When we created the council, we established the UPR and we established a council of 47 members. So at that moment in 2006, we decided, okay, this system will start with the 47 members, the first 
47 members of the council. Because, you know, you, you, if you were a member, you put in practice what you are creating. So that is why Argentina, that was one of the first members, was one of the first UPRs in 2008. From there, you continue a rotation that involves all the membership of the UN. And when you finish the last country, you start again the cycle with the first ones that were under the UPR the first time. That is why that after the end, after the 193, which was the, at the beginning of last year, and I was chairing that, the end of the third cycle, we started again the fourth cycle in November with new UPRs of new countries that were in the first exercise uh, 15 years ago. And that is why Argentina was under the fourth cycle of UPR this January. And I was, it was quite uh, interesting for me to uh, get off the podium as president, just a few days after that, I was as ambassador of Argentina in the UPR of Argentina in January. So I imagine that these UPRs, plus all the discussions leading to resolutions and other instruments like commissions of inquiry, etc., give a pretty precise image of the state of human rights in our world. So, of course, as president, you have had a much more privileged uh, observation deck on the state of the human rights. So what can you say about the situation of human rights in our world today? I'm optimistic that we, we have to look at human rights, even though we have so many challenges and, unfortunately, so many pushbacks, uh, because we have seen advances uh, last year, and as president I witnessed advances, but I witnessed the pushbacks that we all know on women's rights uh, and, and many other th- areas. But I always look in perspective what we do, and definitely I think that the human rights situation of the world in perspective, thanks to the UN and the Human Rights Council and the norms, standards and discussions, is much better than it was 75 years ago when we had the Universal Declaration. Uh, because if, if you look in perspective, for 300 years, international law uh, dealt only with the relationship and the interest of states. Since 1648 until 1948, the notion of the state that we know today, the relation between states didn't care much about the people within each state. That was not part of the international relations. Only exceptions like protection of minorities, humanitarian law, were the few exceptions that we look. But this idea of uh, international law of human rights, what we do, is a revolutionary idea, but at the same time, it's a very young revolution. We are still witnessing the revolution. Uh, we are part of the revolution because 75 years in historical terms of development of human rights is nothing. If we look at the challenges uh, of uh, how many challenges still we have on inequality on social economical rights, uh, the 1.2 billion people that do not have access to drink or water, the 77 countries that still criminalize same-sex relationships or and some with death penalty, but at the same time, you know what? Last year year, over 38 countries changed their legislation to include and accept the, the sexual orientation and gender identity rights. So you see a mixed world. And a very important assessment of last year is that we have to go beyond this notion, which is a misperception, I think, a fallacy on a, a, a region or countries imposing values on other countries. Because if you look at what happened last year, you had some regressions of human rights issues and basic norms on refugee law, on migration, on women's rights in very developed, in the most developed nations and very strong liberal democracies. And at the same time, you had amazing advances from the abolition of the death penalty in Sierra Leone or the referendum in Cuba accepting same-sex marriage with adoption of children by 70% of the population. So are we saying that Cuba decided to do that and change this, the institutional uh, view of this 
because of an imposition of values of other countries? No. Each society has its own dynamics to, to find. But the, what I see as pressing is that the world at large has much, much more awareness uh, that the progressive development, the wheel of the progressive development of human rights has to go uh, always forward, never backwards. That is why we are fighting, for example, on the older persons, the new instrument that we are looking for. We have a, a specific international instrument for the protection of women, of children, of persons with disabilities. And now we see the vulnerability of other persons. We saw it in the pandemic. And those abstract discussions on the rights of other persons, we need an international instrument to rightly protect uh, the rights of other persons. So the will is always, but, but the pushbacks are, you know, sporadic, but they are firm. We need to have discussions uh, not to, to, to be serious, those pushbacks. You mentioned last year several times, <coughs> it was a special year also for, uh, for international relations mm. at large, special year for the uh, Human Rights Council itself. Several amazing things happened there. Um, you have recently spoken about your presidency in terms of steering a boat in the middle of a tsunami. That image uh, stayed with me and I guess with many, many people who heard it, heard you say that. So, yes, 2022 was a special year um, for the council as well. Um, for example, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council were all aboard the ship of the Human Rights Council at the beginning of the year. But the year was going to become even more special by February How was it from the presidency podium? Uh, well, it was a game changer, definitely, for the experience I expected. I knew the challenge would be important as president because uh, since uh, the, um, human rights is part of the national identity and uh, part of our foreign policy, so I was prepared to be very, you know, uh, serious in, in, in the role of president as Argentina president. But of course, the, the war uh, changed everything. I had so many, so many expectations and good projects for having the five permanent members of the Security Council at the same time in the, in the Human Rights Council. I had many projects of having a open Chatham House conversations among the B5 um, on, on the link between peace, security and human rights in order to, to because we know that the best way to prevent a conflict is to have a strong human rights institution. That's proven by a fact uh, of what happened in, in, in the world. And the best way post-conflict is to have human rights institutions to be created to prevent the conflict. from. So all those projects imploded, of course, in, on, on February 24th. It was very difficult. Uh, it was very difficult because uh, the, that phrase that was uh, uh, viral has uh, also a, an additional uh, point. I always say it was not any ship. Uh, I was the captain of a, of a ship with a very valuable cargo you uh, uh, and the valuable cargo was the human rights of the world so, therefore i knew that uh, i had to keep the boat floating and uh, the most difficult thing was it was so blunt uh, the the geopolitics and the opinion on what was happening that i had many voices that came to me as president because the the heart of the presidency is not on the podium i can tell you that's the easiest part the most difficult part is off the podium when you have the victims when you have the countries that are suffering a, a situation like this so i listen from voices to put all the weight in the ship on the front or on the back of the ship and i knew that if i listen to those voices the ship will sink. Uh, so um, keeping dialogue with everybody, regardless of the geopolitics, my office open to every PR all the time without discrimination, and my phone open and my WhatsApp open with every PR, and also open to NGOs and victims. Of course, I, it's a privilege, I can tell you, because as president, you can see the bigger picture, and you are not representing your country. So uh, 
um, uh, I have five. Con- I had five conversations with the foreign ministry of a country uh, to convince them to to accept the contribution of the of the Human Rights Council to improve their situation. And if I had to put five minutes of a foreign minister as an Argentine ambassador with that country, probably I would have never done that. And I did this because I was president and I had to keep the boat floating. So it was a, a, a marvelous exercise of, of diplomacy that I had to put, uh, but I, I had a lot of cooperation with all the countries. I think we all understood how important it was, and that is why it gained the visibility in the media. Uh, let's remember, uh, the Human Rights Council last year became the intergovernmental body of the whole UN system with the highest presence in social media. That's because people started following the council to, because we were addressing things that cared to the people. That's, that's, that's why we were obliged, and I was obliged at present, to have a public diplomacy strategy for people to understand what we do. And that's why we ended up having, uh, you know, uh, uh, regular interviews on, on, on the media, on TV, on radio, uh, because people were interested um, in what we were doing. We, were, we had to keep uh, the momentum. But it was, it was difficult, but, but I enjoyed every minute. So in a way, you could, as a captain, steer the boat out of out of the storm, and that you did rather successfully, at least for observers that were observing from the sidelines, from outside the council, um, through also social media, which is a discrete improvement for the UN way of being open and transparent to the general public. There is a lot of activity on our websites, maybe this podcast is part of it, but the live interaction through social media as the council was in session i think was really something that uh, was able to communicate the key discussions to a general public that is not part of let's say the larger let's say international or multilateral diplomacy expert crowd the boat goes through the storm you're successfully and skillfully taking it out of the storm Was there any damage? Do you think that today this boat is stronger, the cargo is safe, or there was some damage? Um, It's at risk, but it's safe. And we have to be very careful to continue. Even if the boat is going at a slower pace, it doesn't matter, as long as it's floating. So if you look at the discussions we have on... On, uh, on polarization and politicization. Um, I, you know, I started my, my presidency saying that I wanted to address that. And of course, the, the war uh, changed everything. But at the same time, it was such a shock in diplomacy that the polarization and politicization could have become a paralysis. And let's be honest, we are here in Geneva. We see bodies that are paralyzed because of the politicization. That is because these bodies, these international multilateral bodies, were not able to prevent on time the polarization, the politicization to become polarization and the polarization to become paralysis. In the council, I was very, very sure that if we don't, didn't do something, this polarization could become a paralysis. And we, we did didn't have the luxury to paralyze the Human Rights Council, especially last year. So um, I think that is stronger because we realize the importance, first of all, actors that have not been so active in the council uh, trying to get other countries on board the certain initiatives had to work for it at the highest level to get an involvement. Um, you know, uh, I had a, a, one important leader, one of the most important leader in the news today, <laughs> uh, in the geopolitics of what is happening, uh, talking about the Human Rights Council. Even though it was a criticism to the Human Rights Council, but there's no such thing as bad publicity for one of the 153 subsidiary organs of the GA. We have to remember that. We are the Human Rights Council. We represent one of the three pillars of the UN. 
And we all agree that there's no peace and security and development without human rights. But we are institutionally one of the 153 subsidiary organs of the GA, and the UN human rights system has only 4% of the UN budget. So that is why the ship and the cargo, you have to keep it because the, the resources that we have are not in, are limited. So we have to protect our resources. And I think it's stronger, and that is why at the end of my presidency, I decided to have something that has never been done before, that everybody ended up being so happy, and I'm happy that everybody was happy, which is an informal conversation with Chatterhouse Rules, uh, over 60 ambassadors, four hours, without phones, without written statements, and we discussed everything. We talked about the most difficult things that we never talk openly on web TV because of obvious reasons. And the... The summary is public, so you can look it at the, uh, of course, without attribution of who said what, but the basic uh, content of that discussion uh, is public. And if you look at the feedback of all the delegations, it was a very important exercise that everybody wants to repeat. And uh, because we feel that we are talking in two minutes, 30 seconds in the council on such difficult issues, and sometimes we don't have enough time to express why we say what we say. Why do we have a position? So, you know, all the successful negotiations have to go through three different stages. From wishes, you go to positions, and you try to defend your wishes to convince others, but then you find the third stage, which is the common interest. And sometimes in the council, because of the dynamics of the council, we are not, we don't have this time, this opportunity to find the common interest. And that is why regular informal conversations of, at the level of ambassadors are so important to understand each other. You mentioned limited resources. You mentioned the council being just one of the 154, which is a, a host of uh, a subsidiary organs. So, how do you make the difference during the work of the Council between these cases of human rights violations that are classically those emerging from conflict areas? Okay, In conflict, human rights are on a losing ground. These are the most uh, egregious cases of violations. But there are other global issues that preoccupy the Council and the international community. What are these? How do you manage with so little resources to cover the spectrum of violation of human rights beyond what happens in armed conflicts? Uh, well, the, the only way to manage is uh, thanks to the uh, effort, the commitment, and the hard work of all the stakeholders that are behind the Human Rights Council. We have to look at everything we do how we are able to address so many difficult issues um, with the people behind those discussions. And we are talking about the NGOs, we are talking about the small countries with small delegations doing a huge effort to be present, to be part of the informal conversations and the discussions. And um, in, in those global issues uh, is a new social contract of the international community uh, that realizes that the only sustainable development is a, with a human rights perspective and that the only way to keep uh, and maintain peace and security is with a strong human rights perspective. That is something that last year was so obvious with the discussions on climate change, when we saw the vulnerability um, of, of people in climate change, by the way, 80% of the most vulnerable affected by climate change are women um, and, and children. Um, and we saw all these different aspects um, of, of technology and human rights and, and, and of course the discrimination of people for their sexual orientation or gender identity, the violence they are suffering because of that. So all those emerging issues, some are old, some are new, made us uh, realize that uh, 
even though we have few resources, we have to uh, keep those issues with a human rights perspective. It's very difficult uh, because, you know, the special procedures, for example, the independent experts, I, I think that uh, it's so important to understand and value their work. These people uh, are, by the way, are not paid for that. We have to be, they are doing it, I don't know them, and they are very committed to their work. And um, uh, if you talk to any of them, uh, every day they wake up, they go to their inbox, uh, they email, and they have between 200 and 300 emails from all over the world of victims of people trying to get a response to their suffering through the independent expert on extrajudicial executions, on sexual orientation, on violence against women, whatever. So those people are committed to respond to those victims. And they are part of the UN system created by the international community, but they have to have a day job to feed their family on a daily basis. So that type of invisible effort and the small delegations that have maybe four diplomats to address all human rights, all uh, organizations in Geneva, and some of them are even addressing organizations in Vienna. And still, when there is a Human Rights Council meeting important to address an important issue or to have solidarity with somebody from the region that is going through a difficult time, they make the effort, they go to room 20, and they participate. Uh, it's a huge effort. And, of course, the secretariat and the, and the percentage of, uh, of all the people that are behind the, behind the scenes. So, as president, when you see all this, you're reasonably sure that there is positive impact in the world carried by the Human Rights Council. How do we know there is impact? How do you know, as members of the Council, you're having an impact? Uh, you know when people, after a meeting of the Council, after accepting a recommendation of the Council, uh, in the UPR, for example, you can measure the implementation of that acceptance if it became reality. There is a, 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 an, an accountability before the international community when you commit. And when you go and you see um, so many countries, and if you go talk to the U UPR branch, they have the statistics. So many countries that after UPR, they accepted a recommendation, which means I understand I have a problem, I have a challenge, and I need to address this challenge. And then they change the legislation, uh, they abolish the death penalty. Every year you have more and more countries abolishing the death penalty. And all of them have accepted before the Human Rights Council to consider the moratorium or abolishing. And last year, 36 countries, as I mentioned before, changed different aspects of the legislation in relation to sexual orientation or gender identity, and that was after recommendations accepted before the Council. So uh, I think that uh, on a daily basis, people have uh, the rights better protected and more protected because of what we do. That's why I decided as president to have a first experience ever done, never done before, which is bring your children to the council day. And it was a, an amazing experience with uh, 200 children that came, became the Human Rights Council, discussed their preoccupations. It was chaired by uh, one of the children it was fascinating because uh, uh, we we didn't know if it would work. Um, it was uh, we were afraid of the cows, maybe, and and you know what? They gave us a lesson. They kept their time. They were so serious in addressing their statements. They had so much fun, and that is why uh, we have been in these conversations with the Canton de Genève uh, because they would like to to extrapolate this experience to the schools in Geneva to have a, a more regular participation. You know, the same way we do the Model General Assembly, uh, etc., or the Model Security Council. The idea is to have the, a, a permanent model, uh, a, a mock or model a human rights council for children that's very powerful congratulations of having this unique idea 
um, certainly, I'm sure it's going to it's going to continue in in some form. Maybe the presidents after you will want to do also a Children's Day, but that's very powerful also because it communicates directly the universality of human rights. Ambassador Villegas, before we conclude our episode, I wanted to touch a little bit on the relationship between human rights and the evolution of multilateralism, since our podcast is so focused on on this practice and set of values that multilateralism represent in our time. Um, and in this sense, what one could see that um, the Human Rights Council, like any other international body, needs to operate with transparency, objectivity, and at the same time, um, there is in the multilateral world this this tension between the respect of you know the principle of sovereignty uh, of states and this that go with national interests of course of states and and nations and the priorities of member states all this on one hand and on the other hand the universality of human rights the greater good the global challenges that we are all facing and some of them are so intimately connected with human rights when we look at the human rights dimension of uh, of climate change you mentioned that human rights dimension of conflict of migration of inequality etc so as president how do you navigate the tension between between national interest and university of human rights how difficult it is to not follow in fall fall not only the politicization that you mentioned but also in this you know old Westphalian way to look at things where states sit at the very top of the pyramid and then some injustice uh, will happen and you know we have to carry on with uh, state uh, uh, state work uh, here in the UN. Is that vision still here with us or the Human Rights Council is changing something? I, I honestly think that the Human Rights Council, because of its sound work, important professional work of so many people, and moving forward the international law of human rights, is changing that. Uh, it's changing because uh, the principle of sovereignty of states, which is in the Charter, which is in, in our uh, essence of international relations, uh, definitely cannot be used for human rights. Uh, there is a limit. There is a limit. That, that was the decision in 1948. Because we, the never again is exactly that. The decision by which the state is given the force to apply the law and bring justice to the people. So the notion, the Westphalian notion, and also the, 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 international, the, the national criminal law, uh, since Montesquieu, Hobbes, plus Westphalia, etc., all that history was thought of states that decided to apply the law to protect their people. And if somebody within that country, that state, breached the law, had to be put to justice and judge and go to prison. That notion imploded completely with the Holocaust. And it was not the first genocide in history, of course. It's just that we were saturated by those atrocities. And the Holocaust basically brought this new idea that there is a limit for a state how to treat the people under its jurisdiction. And the power that is given to the state of the use of force is okay as long as the state doesn't become a criminal. So this is a notion of a state using force in its own people. The, the Jews, the Bolsheviks, the, the, the gay people that were uh, Nazi victims were Germans. We have to understand that. They were as Germans and other, as other Germans. So this is a, a, an idea that obviously the principle of sovereignty has limited. But we have a problem. And the problem, and that is why the concept of responsibility to protect, for example, was so difficult and still is trying to evolve and never flies. Because the problem is that it was always associated with uh, humanitarian intervention, 
and always associated to the Security Council uh, after we decided to include four crimes as a threat of peace and international security, but the Security Council itself has a veto. So the veto associated with stopping an atrocity has this original scene where you are giving five countries the power of stopping or not a genocide in 187 countries. So that whole notion is very complicated to address. So the only way to try to match human rights and sovereignty is what we do in the council, which is all states come into a multilateral democratic body to address that this is important, that they want to keep their sovereignty. They want to keep, for example, their cultural values that look at human rights in another perspective. But this is the place where we are equal discussing the things. And sometimes when they talk about politicization, selectivity, which is another thing that comes in the council, we have to be honest. This is a multilateral democratic body, and there's no veto. But the 47 members that sit here in the council do not represent 47 countries. They are acting on behalf of the 180 that are not part of the council. That is why, as president, I insisted on three or four uh, new ideas. First, uh, we cannot say that a resolution, because it was uh, uh, put to a vote and I voted against as member of the council, that resolution doesn't exist and that doesn't apply to me or it shouldn't be this real. No, this is absolutely systemically wrong, but absolutely unfair. Because if I'm a member of the council and I vote against a resolution addressing the suffering of victims that are, in, are of a, a member that is not a member of the council, I'm impacting the lack of accountability for suffering of victims of a country that is not sitting. I mean, so if I was given a responsibility by the international community, the GA, to be here, okay, we might not, uh, I might not be in favor of the resolution, but once it's put to a vote and it passes, it has to be implemented. And one of the greatest satisfactions I had, and that is why I think it's stronger, your previous question, in the most difficult year of the Council ever, probably, it, with all everything that we've talked in this podcast, you know what? We approved a hundred resolutions on so many issues, so many situations, everything we talked today, 70% of them were approved by consensus, and only 30% of them were put to a vote. That is only that those numbers are a fact that still there is a huge space for dialogue, for mutual understanding, and to find a common interest whenever we are able to understand each other. And when so many organizations were paralyzed, when we have here in Geneva a, a body which is so dear to me because I started with disarmament, I was a young disarmament fellow, and you have the Conference on Disarmament, the hub of what was the new world in the post-Cold War era that is not able to even establish subsidiary organs, discuss issues, or not even approve a program of work, and hasn't negotiated anything for the last 20 years. So, and there, and you saw in the pandemic, uh, so many organizations that decided just to close the door and wait until the end of it, and we were the first body to uh, vote virtually and, 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 and carry out our works uh, virtually. Uh, and the virtuality, uh, if I, you allow me, the virtuality has, was a game changer last year because those uh, modalities that came bef by force because of the pandemic proved to be so useful for the work of the council because the, we were able to listen to victims directly from the ground live by Zoom or by videos, women in Afghanistan, women in Iran, and, and different people because of the virtuality. In the high-level segment, we were able to get, have a higher uh, participation because we had presidents, prime ministers from all over the world addressing the council uh, 
Um, so uh, that also, the virtuality brought a, a new, a new world in 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 the, um, especially on uh, on democratizing the council. You know, because let's be honest, before in the when everything was in person, only the NGOs that could uh, pay for the ticket to Geneva. Were they able to were able to to be there speaking before the council, and that is very unfair because it's not the same thing to 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 buy a plane ticket of fifty euros from uh, London than to take a ticket from New Zealand or Argentina. Uh, it's a huge effort. It's completely different. And you know what? The virtuality allowed that small NGO from New Zealand or Argentina or Bangladesh to prepare a statement and participate at the same level as the big NGO that is based in a European capital. And that is amazing in, in the matter of democratization of a body. So hybrid meetings going a long way in making a difference in terms of Definitely. participation, inclusivity, and uh, perhaps even impact. Yes, that message is clear, Ambassador. As we wrap up the um, the, 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 the episode, counting on those facts, looking at what the Council is able to do at this point in time in the history of international relations, which is not by all means an easy one, I'm wondering then what is the relationship between the multilateralism that we know today and human rights. Multilateralism is under pressure. The model that we build of the Second World War is showing a relatively an ability to solve global problems. Yet you are giving us a picture in which the Human Rights Council is determined, is able to have an impact, is able to uh, deal with uh, res resources that are limited, but yet hold discussions that are substantive and they are game changers in some, in some instances. So what is the relationship between the evolution of multilateralism and human rights? Is multilateralism under pressure, under pressure and that creates a problem for you in the human rights sphere? Do you need a more open multilateralism to progress further in the work of the Council? How do you leave that in the current situation in the international arena? Very interesting question, and I've been thinking a lot about that. Because of the practice, as a practitioner ambassador in Geneva, before the organizations. Um, first of all, I don't think it's a challenge to the Human Rights Council. On the contrary, I think it's a huge opportunity uh, for the Human Rights Council. I imagine the HRC in Geneva as a multivitaminic. Uh, you know, uh, um, what we do, the outcome, the type of discussions we are having are the ones that, if introduced properly, in some discussions in Geneva, multilateral discussions can bring light to certain issues that are there, whether you like it or not. Today, we have human rights discussions in almost every single international organization uh, in Geneva. Uh, you ha we had human rights discussions within WHO, uh, and we are talking about real difficult discussions at the highest level, General Assembly, that all of a sudden ended up being human rights discussion. And it was fascinating how all missions had to bring their human rights experts from the HRC to talk to the health experts of the missions to see and address a certain issue in WHO that was originally not a human rights issue, but for different reasons, which are obvious, right to health, etc., uh, ended up being in ILO, uh, the new DG, which is very committed to this global coalition of social justice. We, this, there cannot be social justice without a human rights perspective. And we had a huge discussion on, with the human rights issue on uh, last week in ILO. And in in disarmament, in transparency of armaments, or in the in the lethal autonomous weapons, which is the discussion. The discussion is precisely uh, the human rights uh, impact that these type of weapons have. So I think that in the next phase 
is a is a is a dialogue in a regular dialogue of international organizations here in Geneva that realize that what uh, happens in room 20 doesn't stay in room 20 this is not like the las vegas you know and uh, uh, what happens in las vegas stays in las vegas and i said this uh, in new york also this notion that what happens in geneva stays in geneva is a, a human rights is a geneva issue that is from the past that doesn't exist anymore the same in geneva what happens in room 20 affects everybody And we are the same countries. Um, and so the next phase is this uh, uh, multilateralism that, with, uh, that naturally incorporates a human rights discussion without the fear that this is something that is too political, that is too sensitive, that will affect my bilateral relationships with important countries. This is a point of no return. Human rights is the key for development and is the key for peace and security. This, and last year probably was the year where we realized that that is a fact. Therefore, instead of combating that notion, that evolution of human rights in multilateralism, let's uh, bring it naturally to our discussions of course using the HRC which is the hub, the technical hub because sometimes in the international organizations in Geneva when they realize there is no other way but to talk about human rights the first fear, and it's natural the first fear is well but we don't have human rights people in our secretariat And that is why you have the HRC. So you can have a fluid dialogue between the Office of the High Commissioner and ILO, WHO, ONU, CEDA, whenever something with a human rights perspective, uh, labor rights were not, 100 years ago, were not mentioned as human rights. But we all know we are talking about human rights, decent jobs. What are we talking? We are talking about human rights. And 190 convention of ILO on, on women and gender, what is? It's human rights. So this dialogue of technical multivitaminic that is able to introduce properly the human rights discussion is the future, definitely. This is very clear, very powerful. And for those in our audience who are not conversant with the Palais, Room 20 that you mentioned several times, Times is the conference room here in the United Nations uh, uh, office in Geneva that is most often used by the Human Rights Council. So for us practitioners, it basically equates to the house of the Human Rights Council. Ambassador, as we wrap up this episode, um, what is the message from the 16th president of the Human Rights Council that you want our audience to imprint in their memory? Uh, continue following what we do in the council because not only it affects your life it's the place where we are discussing how to have for you listeners your present and your future with your rights more protected or better protected that's one thing and the other is that whenever you get on the bus or the train and you feel the empathy for the suffering of somebody that you don't even know that is on the other side of the world because you saw the news on your phone. If there is a place where that suffering uh, is being discussed, addressed with different mechanisms here in the Human Rights Council. So immediately that you uh, see, uh, watch the news and you want to continue knowing more about that situation of that people that are suffering, you immediately go to the Twitter account of the HRC and you will find the most important technical and deep information and assessment of that situation that brought the empathy for the suffering. Those two are powerful tools that I think that listeners will enjoy and Uh, since we had an, a, an amazing increase of, of followers last year, unprecedented, uh, I hope that that uh, continues because we will touch your life for sure. Ambassador Federico Villegas, 16th President of the Human Rights Council and also Permanent Representative of Argentina to the UN in Geneva. Thank you so much for your time, for being with us on the next page. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations for the podcast.